So yes, so um, maybe the, yeah, as we did for the other, the other discussion session, maybe we can ask uh, uh, the various speaker to spend a few minutes talking, uh, highlighting uh, about their paper. Maybe we can start from, uh, um, I think uh, I've, I've seen all of you, so maybe Hiroshi Izono can start, he says around. Okay, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay, the uh, summary of my talk is that uh, uh, we uh, 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 investigated the structure of the wave function of the uh, wave function of the uh, free scalar field in Dosita. Uh, when the mass of the scalar is heavier than d over 2, that means uh, the free scalar is in the principal series. And then the, uh, we found that the coefficient of the... Ah, can we share the um, uh, slide now? Uh, yes, yes. yes. Uh, if you made the host. I think it's better because the content is a bit technical. <laughs> Even if it's a it's simple result, you can start sharing screen. Yeah, uh, let me see. No, this one. Oh, no. uh, can you can you see the screen? Yes. Yes. Uh, this is a uh, uh, summary of the result. Uh, so, so when uh, does uh, it have, uh, 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 when a free scalar field in a does it have the, uh, is, is light, I mean, uh, uh, the mass is smaller than d half, then the structure of the wave function. Uh, is uh, uh, just a Gaussian because uh, we are thinking, uh, I'm uh, looking at the <coughs> uh, free scalar field. And this is uh, essentially the same, uh, this, is, this has the same structure as the ADS case. But if the mass of the scalar is heavy in the principal series, then the structure of wave function is uh, given by the, the final line. Uh, I mean the exponent of the wave function squared uh, has a coefficient that is uh, totally different from the uh, scale invariant one. I mean, uh, this is one over uh, one plus uh, some factor times the k to the power of two i mu. So it's clearly the not scale invariant. And uh, this is due to the oscillatory feature of this uh, power factor of the momentum. And on the ADS side, you should be looking at uh, for scalars with mass below the BF bound. Where exactly, all the yeah. That you actually, yeah. Actually, I added uh, this slide after uploading the movie. <laughs> yeah. That's why I <laughs> wanted to share the slide. And uh, so this is a more appropriate comparison. Yeah. Then, yeah, thanks. Then the sorry. So I wanted to ask. There is this paper by uh, Harlow and Stanford. I can. Ah yeah uh, yeah. I, uh, I think it's very much related. I I will put the link on the chat. Ah yeah yeah. Uh, I it's I I think it's basically a very similar thing where, where they explain how the oscillatory factors. Uh, cancel in case of the sitter, but they do not cancel in case of ADS. And I, I think they, I, this one plus, I, I recall seeing the same kind of structure. I don't know if if you have any comments about it. Yeah, I forgot. Uh, so, so the, uh, did they uh, discuss the case of this principal series in detail or? 
I thought that they they were discussing the case uh, of the mass smaller than they have in the complementary series that I forgot. So, do you know about that? Yeah, I, I don't remember the details. Uh, I think that they, <laughs> I, I don't think they discussed the, this principal series case in detail, and they only discussed the uh, light case, complementary series, if I remember correctly. Yeah. And also, uh, I have some additional comment uh, that is not in the movie. And uh, re uh, after, the, after uploading the movie, we found that uh, this uh, coefficient, uh, one over one plus the two point function squared, uh, may be interpreted as a uh, two point function of a, a non conformal field theory that is obtained as a double trace deformation of a, a conformal field theory. And uh, actually, we are <coughs> summarizing this result now, and I hope the, the result will appear in one or two weeks. Yeah, this is additional comment on my own talk. Maybe an, another comment. I mean, looking at your slides, I don't think you're doing a holographic normalization properly. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That that could also affect some. Of, but yeah. now I see yeah. if you include the 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 the, the tachyons, then now they do agree from what I see. Yeah, 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 yeah. So so yeah. So of course, in this appropriate uh, comparison, of course they are related by the uh, analytic continuation as we expect because it's a definition of analytic continuation. <laughs> yeah, right. Yes. Thanks. Okay, so uh, maybe we can move to the next one. Uh, uh, Massimo Tarona. Massimo is around. Yes, I'm here. Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay, maybe we can make him a host and he can share slides. Yeah, okay. so I can also share my slides. I stopped the sharing. So, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, but Guy. Guy yes, yes. So now, you're, now you should be able to share. Yes. It should work right now. Yeah, it's working. Well, okay. So, uh, just to summarize very briefly my talk, uh, it's in the context of uh, bootstrapping these uh, cosmological correlators. So, with Charlotte, in uh, some previous paper, we had developed some Bell in space formalism and we had some results about that. But uh, the actual focus of this talk was to make some connection between explicit connection between these uh, correlators in the sitter and what is actually known in anti the sitter. In anticipated space. Basically, the key points are can, I can go to a couple of slides where I start to just to summarize the key points. One point is this one is that uh, using this Mellin space formalism, there is a very simple way to reconstruct the full exchange amplitude, both in anti the sitter and the sitter, uh, from the discontinuity. So, in anti the sitter, this would just correspond to a single conformal block. Okay, and then from this, uh, the knowledge of the just kinematical knowledge of conformal block, you can reconstruct the full exchange amplitude in anti the sitter. And the word out is that a similar statement holds true also for the sitter correlators. And now you should replace what is this single conformal block that was in anti the sitter with a particular combination of conformal blocks with particular overall coefficients that are given by some sinusoidal factors. And then the full exchange comes in a simple way, a little bit like in, the, in terms of some dispersion relation. And then uh, what uh, the other main uh, is that after, all, uh, after one has done this, one can also, since of this simple relation between this continuity and exchanges, both in anti the sitter and the sitter, one can actually write down a general uh, relation between the full exchange amplitude in the sitter and analogous complicated functions that describe exchange amplitude in anti the sitter. This is the main result of this of the of, uh, of that I presented, and you see these sinusoidal factors here 
which uh, parameterize basically how the conformal block enter into uh, the conformal partial weight expansion. So the main, the main motivation is this, and these results actually would allow, uh, allows us to also have these uh, sitter correlators in position space, and also clarify the fact that they are actually, in the bunch Davis vacuum, they, they are single valued functions, which was not completely obvious from momentum space. Uh, and uh, I would say this is a uh, short summary. If you have any question, I would be happy to answer. Can I ask quickly, you, you mentioned uh, uh, during uh, the questions on Hayden's talk that you have some uh, results from partially massless. Can you say a few words about that? Yes, uh, so these, I, I didn't mention at all this in the talk because it was uh, in 30 minutes, there would have been no much time. Uh, but uh, so using this melting space formalism, we, uh, we can actually, we have a control on the, on the word identities that uh, should be satisfied by both three-point and four-point amplitude. So the idea is to actually uh, understand how these word identities work out and uh, impose the cancellation so that, uh, I mean, there are possible terms that enter these word identities. And some terms are good, but some other terms that are, have bulk singularity and should cancel out. Imposing, we can do it actually very generally for arbitrary masses. And imposing this cancellation, we can get precisely all the Weinberg theorem uh, generalization for arbitrary spin, arbitrary mass, and so on. And we can also have an extension of this result to partial masses where the word identity starts being a little bit more complicated, but you can, uh, you can actually do some similar statements. Actually, partial masses is a very interesting example because many tool the, the naive uh, um, so there exist partially massless couplings with uh, scalar fields of different mass. So there are funny interactions of partially massless fields and scalars. And uh, very often it's, it doesn't exist for a, a three-point function of a partially massless uh, odd depth uh, partially massless field with scalars of the same mass. So uh, this was, uh, and we actually, so we, but in that case, one should look at uh, other couplings with the scalars of different mass, which actually are shifted by integers. And you can actually derive similar constraints for those uh, word identities and uh, also for those exchanges. So I, 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 unfortunately, I don't have a slide where to explain this right now. But uh, the main point is that we have uh, actual control on these word identities and by using the melding space formally. So in melding space, it's clear what you have, it has to cancel and imposing that cancellation precisely end up on charge conservation on uh, equivalence principles and you can generalize part of this constraint. Can I ask also a question? The relation on the slide we're just seeing on the screen is it yes. natural from the perspective of the wave function? So this equation is uh, for the actual cosmological correlators. Yeah, yeah, I know. So but if you so you are asking the wave function, yeah, you are asking if you can find a similar relation for the wave function, right? That's your. But I mean, this is a piece of the wave function, right? This is. It's uh, a, yeah, I mean, you already somehow you've already integrated out the unphysical part that you didn't wanted to have in the wave function. So, yeah, but uh, I mean, if you're asking if there is a similar relation for the wave function, I mean, I would say so, but I'm not, sure, I'm not entirely sure because there are some issues with some propagators that you should consider. So I would say that, uh, so I, you should consider this equation as at the level of the correlator, not at the level of the wave function. And if I start from the wave function, then the two-point function is like the propagator. And then, uh, you know, the, kind of the four-point function is going to come from a diagram where, let's say, the, the vertices are going to be three-point functions of the CFT. And then yes. Uh, yes. the propagators yes. are going to be one over, you know, the, 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 the two-point function. Yes. yes. And usually this, this expression is kind of sort of explain these prefactors. Like the three-point functions, they were very natural. This, the, the, the yeah, and, yeah, the I mean, the factors. sinusoidal factors are actually very interesting because they, they just come from simple analytic continuation in the momenta. These, uh, these phases come from analytically con analytic continuation of KI of the external lens. And uh, the important, the, the, the fact that they, they have uh, just uh, overall coefficient, it follows 
from a very important property of the bunch Davis vacuum. In the bunch Davis vacuum, all these dependence always come with the same sign. And so all the melding variable dependence simplifies and you just get to see it. All the melding variables disappear. So you just get sign, sign function. This would not be true, for instance, in alpha vacuum. You would still, you will not get a simple relation like this in alpha vacuum. I mean, we have exactly, in a sense, the same. So the bunch Davis vacuum and then a continuation of the momentum gave the relation between from the one to the other. Just, I was just wondering whether it's the same continuation we have for three point functions. I mean, you see, yeah, you have two exchanges in anti. This is a, you should read this equation as a functional relation. Is whatever you are in momentum space, you can write it in position space. It's just some function that is the in the CFT, in the Euclidean CFT, which is the exchange in the system. You can write as this sum of these two functions, which you can interpret as anti the system. So, what do you mean by analytic continuation of exchange? You see, there are two exchanges here from the perspective. Well, I just want to address on the entire correlator. I think it's probably better to discuss it. Uh... Yeah, yeah, but that, I'm not discussing. I'm not discussing the wave function. So, but I, I agree that there should be some. There must be some relation. In, that sense. in a sense, if you would start from let's say, the four-point function with the CFT and do a continuation, then you automatically land into the cosmological correlator. That's what happens for two and three-point functions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, maybe uh, maybe the same the here, but uh, um, anyway. We, we, we can yeah, yeah, yeah. It, would nice, it would be nice to match uh, these out and, and to find to compare with I mean should we get the same result of course but here we used some we didn't we, we just bootstrap the consistency of this uh, correlator in the sitter finding the combination of conformal block that is required by consistent time evolution in the past and of course it should match whatever you get you, you would do uh, at the level of the wave function Okay, maybe we can uh, maybe we can back on this and uh, we can move on to we have two more to two, two more papers to discuss. One is the uh, is Dimitri Ponomarev around? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Okay, you want that? Let me stop sharing. Cassa, bit. Well, now anyone should be able to share without a problem without hosting. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, can you see uh, the slides? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so like in brief, uh, what I was talking about in the video is the following. So we are attempting to develop the spinner helicity formalism in ADS. And I have to warn you immediately that this spinner helicity formalism is something different from the one which was suggested by Juan and uh, Guilherme in 2011. And the key difference is as follows. So in, in their approach, they pick uh, a specific direction of time, which breaks SO3,1 covariance down to SO3. And then one uses SO3 spinners. Instead, we want to stay as close as possible to the flat space formalism, and we try to keep SO3,1 covariance manifest, that is, we use Lorentz spinners. Uh, so I won't go like into details how this works. Uh, I will just flash you some, uh, yes some results, intermediate results. Let's say uh, for plane waves, what we use is something as follows. So in flat space, so these are plane waves for field stresses. So for field stresses, the only difference in flat space is that in flat space, you don't have this, fa this factor. So you have this kind of exponent IPX, you have also these factors that carry spinner indices. But in ADS, you have also this factor, which is just ADS conformal factor raised to some power. And yeah. This is basically it. And with the plane waves, we can uh, start to computing amplitudes in the standard way, like from just bulk integrals. So we do this. Uh, this is one thing that we do. So like this is like some example of vertex that we analyzed. We also considered four point uh, vertices of scalar fields. And also besides that, uh, we studied symmetries. Uh, so we are, as in many talks uh, in this conference, we try to study uh, amplitudes uh, by, by imposing correct transformation properties. And what we found, for example, we classified three-point amplitudes uh, in this formalism in ADS for spinning fields. And like the difference with the flat space is very like minor, is that uh, unlike in flat space, where this factor is absent, here we also get this factor. This factor is just an operator. 
let me show you how it looks like. Uh, this is an operator, yeah, here. It contains box P, that is, it acts on a delta function of P, where P is the total momentum. So you, you don't have just delta function of P, but it's also like supplemented with some derivatives acting on it. But besides that, this formula is identical to the flat space one. Uh, and similar results are valid for four point functions. So we studied only contact interactions at the four point uh, level. So what we want to do, we want to study exchanges uh, to understand analytic structure and do all the standard machinery, like in many like talks that were, uh, like these days, like understand optical theorem, et cetera, et cetera. So this is basically it. Uh, there's a do you, do you already see some simplification with respect to the formal of uh, um, the Senate in, in Guillermo or? Uh... Uh, uh, well, so I, uh, well, in fact, when we started doing this, we didn't know about this paper, but, so I didn't like compare. So our goal, in fact, was different. Uh, like I have some motivation uh, related to higher spins, higher spin theories. So I didn't compare, but well, you can see the result here. I guess it's a, it's a bit simpler. So you see uh, like there is just a single factor here. And this is the only difference with the, with the flat space result. So I would say it's quite efficient and like the eventual form is like very concise. Uh, I have a question. Uh, so in your case, uh, these are plane wave solutions, so they're not really boundary correlators in the usual sense? Uh, well, so, well, these are not bulk to boundary propagators of usual ADS safety, which means that these plane waves are not associated with uh, like uh, localized sources as people usually have. Mm -hmm. But instead, these are somehow like smeared over the boundary. It was still some sources on the boundary, but smeared in some way. Do you see any cosmological application? Uh, well, so as I could see uh, during this conference, people here prefer uh, using a Fourier uh, transform right on the boundary. Uh, so this, uh, this representation is a bit different, so I don't know about the connection, but in principle, I guess this can be fully applied to DS. And yeah, but you will get some like different representation. Maybe then you can study how it's connected to the one that you're using. Thank you. I wanted to, to ask a question and make a comment. Maybe I'll make the comment first because it's related to the previous questions, applications to cosmology. So when you think about cosmology, there is something that naturally breaks uh, time translations and boosts and, and, and selects a preferred frame in which the universe looks uh, homogeneous and isotropic. And so from that point of view, the choice of spinor elicity that Guy and, and Juan had in their paper is more natural, in, meaning that the breaking as of SO3,1 down to SO3 is exactly what you expect in cosmology because you're really breaking those symmetries. You're only left with, uh, in a generic FLRW with rotations. So mm -hmm. it might be that the simplifications that you see when you have the full ADS symmetries are lost when you go to some realistic cosmological scenario in which there is a preferred uh, foliation in time. So, yeah. so that was the comment. Going to the questions, this function G that you said has some derivatives acting on the delta function, is that a finite number of derivatives and does it depend on the interactions? So this G is just uh, like uh, one plus box P essentially. So box P is second derivative with respect to P. Uh, but the power of G that you need, it depends on like various like aspects of like vertices that you are using. So here H is a total helicity. So it's raised to the power H minus one. So you, yeah, for higher helicities, you have many uh, powers of boxes. Because to me, this seems basically saying that energy is not really conserved. The amplitude is not proportional to a delta function but the amount by which is not conserved depends on how many derivatives you're taking. So the fact that here you have delta prime, delta double prime up to a certain number of derivatives on the delta tells you how many powers of the total energy can appear in this that you're sensitive to, if you think of this in terms of a distribution. So this is very closely related to this K total that we've been discussing uh, in this workshop. And in some sense we are saying that the amplitude emerges on the residue of k total, 
but there, there is also a little bit of information from flat space on the subleading terms. Huh? And this is what we are saying here. In flat space, it would be captured by derivative of the delta function if we allow the amplitude to have delta prime, delta double prime. So, so I think that that's interesting that you find also that, that mm -hmm. result. I just wanted to like stress in this regard that one should be careful uh, with what is meant by P here. So in, uh, well, in ADS uh, of like ADS4, there are no four like momenta, which are uh, like, uh, which are isometries. So what is meant by P here is something like a bit tricky. Right, so the way it works, uh, like in the coordinates, let's say that you use, you have specific time, but then uh, once you picked it, uh, you, you have slicing of, a, of DS into, well, let's say 3D Minkowski. And in 3D Minkowski, well, you have translations, three translations, and you have, a, you, have you can pick associated momenta. And everything works as in flat space, you have momentum conservation. Here, moment, the meaning of momentum is something different. And, well, probably one way to understand what the meaning is, uh, well, by looking at these uh, plane waves. So it's not exactly the momentum in the, in the normal sense. So that's what I want to say. I mean, in the limit, uh, if you expand in uh, powers of Hubble, you would like to have a flat space limit of this object, which is exactly the amplitude. So hopefully that limit P is P mu, right? In the flat space, space limit, it's exactly, yeah. Um, yeah, so here we're saying there are corrections to that due to the fact that this is not really flat space, but there is some space-time curvature. And so things are not conserved in the way you would expect. Uh, yeah. So it's not exactly a delta function. Mm -hmm. Can you flash your formula for four points? So for four points, uh, we studied uh, contact interactions. So we found that uh, you can bring amplitudes to the form like this. So here you again see a delta function. You have some power of the uh, well of that operator that involves derivatives. But also we have some polynomial mm -hmm. of uh, Mandelstam variables. Right. So let me write them here. Uh, so, so here they are written, which are just exactly as in flat space. The thing is uh, that you cannot just simply trade for another, let's say S1 for S2. Sure. Here S1 for S2, because for that you need momentum conservation. Sure, sure, sure. Here it's not conserved, so once you try to do that, you break this like very nice form. But, uh, but, but if you have general helicities on the outside, do you still have, I mean, uh, as, as our sort of little previous discussion, uh, when you have helicities on the outside, you just have something with the, with, the, with the universal helicity factor out in front multiplied by your function of sp and u for amplitudes. Is the same thing true here? Can you like factor out all the helicity dependence on the, the left-hand side of an expression of this form? Uh, so, well, I, I would expect that, the, yeah, this is true. Uh, so I didn't look in, at this, but uh, like my collaborator is working on this now. So if he wants to understand whether it works the same way for spinning fields. Can I ask a question? Do you have a formula for a, for a polarization vector? Because one annoying thing of this... Uh, formalism we developed in, in DS is that we had to use the freedom of the reference spinner that one uses in flat space in order to set the zero component to zero. Yeah, so here is the example of uh, uh, well, potential for spin two, uh, which carries helicity plus two. Uh, so how we constrain this, we try to keep the condition that the potentials are transverse to an auxiliary vector like like vector which is made of two spinners. So this is how we constrain them. And let's say for spin two, what we get is the following. So this piece is exactly as in flat space. So you have the exponent and this is the square of the flat space polarization vector. But in areas, we also have some extra dependence on axis. Here we use uh, what's called stereographic coordinates. So B is just X squared, A is just PX. So there is some extra stuff. But we, yeah, we have this reference spinner uh, just like in flat space, so you, and you can try to use it to simplify computations the way you do it in flat space. I see. Okay.
Okay, is there a follow up? Because uh, we have one more to go. When, uh, we're going to have now, uh, otherwise, we, okay, we can just continue. We're going to have a, a look, it looks like a Blackboard presentation now. From, uh, Not a presentation. No, a uh, summary, Blackboard summary, sorry. <laughs> from Yasha. For, for now, it's just a Blackboard. I apologize, okay. That's uh, uh, not... Uh, Sounds good. <laughs> okay. okay. Okay, good. So you can hear me. Uh, so it's 1 a.m. right now, so I apologize for any glitches in my composure. Uh, so uh, in the video, I have talked about uh, a general philosophy, uh, a simple free field paper that uh, we had last year, uh, and uh, a simple uh, interacting work that we have upcoming. So the the philosophy is that uh, like I, I, I don't want uh, the boundary correlators uh, in the sitter. Uh, what I want is to uh, think of myself as uh, an observer living uh, inside the sitter. Uh, and then like the, the closest thing to uh, scattering amplitudes or boundary correlators uh, will be the evolution uh, of uh, fields or states uh, from the initial horizon to the final horizon of the static patch. Um, and uh, then like, the zeroth trick towards uh, solving this, uh, as it appears, uh, is to uh, express this as a concatenation uh, of uh, two problems, where each time we relate uh, just one horizon uh, to some global uh, structure, uh, like uh, the conformal boundary, uh, or uh, if we're really fancy twister space. Okay. Uh, and uh, this uh, square rooted problem uh, of uh, single horizon to boundary uh, is nicer because it's more symmetric. So it, it has uh, the symmetries of the Poincare coordinates, and then we can use the 3D momenta that uh, everybody here likes so much. Um, so that's the general philosophy. Uh, now, the uh, free field story was that uh, like we used uh, basically exactly Juan and Guy's uh, spinner helicity variables, uh, but uh, on uh, horizons instead of uh, on the conformal boundary, uh, and uh, figured out that uh, we can write the free field evolution uh, from one horizon to another uh, as just a Fourier transform. Uh, of the spinner helicity variables, uh, which is uh, simply uh, just a nice way of uh, writing the fact that uh, on the boundary, uh, if we go from one horizon to the other, then in terms of the, the one correct coordinates on the boundary, the origin of one of them can be called zero, the origin of the other can be called infinity, and then uh, evolving from one horizon to another is uh, just an inversion. Uh, and uh, it turns out that uh, uh, that, of course, just Fourier transforms the spinner helicity variables. Okay. Uh, so then uh, we want to go uh, interacting. Uh, and uh, no, so, sorry, let, let me actually connect uh, to this uh, story that we had about the boostless uh, uh, problem uh, in the small. So the, the symmetry uh, of the uh, horizon to boundary uh, problem uh, is uh, exactly this uh, boostless uh, symmetry. Right? So we have uh, the rotations, translations, dilatations uh, in 3D but not the conformals. Uh, and uh, it's really essential uh, for a non-trivial uh, horizon to horizon S matrix to exist, uh, that uh, this doesn't have uh, special conformals or uh, inversions uh, as a symmetry, because uh, if, it, uh, if it did, then the mapping from the boundary to uh, each of the horizons would be the same and they would cancel out. Uh, so the horizons end up related just by the free field evolution. Uh, so, uh, so there is a claim that uh, in higher spin gravity, that is uh, what happens. Uh, and then the S matrix is trivial uh, up to uh, probably 
uh, interesting soft issues that they don't understand. Now, in the kind of more pedestrian field theories, like uh, Young Mills GR, like we expect the horizon to horizon uh, evolution to be non trivial, uh, and we want to just uh, calculate it by solving the horizon to boundary problem. Uh, which uh, should not be the same as just the boundary correlators, again, because it's, it will not be invariant under uh, the entire de Sitter group. Uh, it won't have the special conformals. Okay. And like, then uh, we have this uh, work where the student allegedly did the calculations and uh, now uh, need to see that it checks out and, uh, and uh, tie up the ends uh, of uh, actually you know, doing these kinds of written diagrams uh, with uh, you know, uh, two, two legs uh, under on the boundary, say, and uh, one on the horizon, uh, and uh, I I feel a bit weird uh, doing such uh, silly things, uh, and uh, I keep having the anxiety that uh, it's all been done in the eighties. Uh, like I, I I don't talk to uh, uh, f folks like you a lot, so. Uh, I, I'm uh, mostly here uh, for a sanity check, whether this kind of stuff. Maybe I'll make a comment. Yeah. So if you just look for uh, the city gravity, actually the same is true for ABS gravity, but it, with a diagram tilted, mm -hmm. you can define initial value problem where you either give data on the horizon or you can give the data on the conformal boundary and they're two are equivalent. You can it's just, so that, that, that relates data from one to the other. So. So we done this quite explicitly in, in, in body gauge a couple of years ago. Uh, okay, so, so can you maybe re repeat the beginning? Uh, so what is it? Uh, you can formulate this first classically, actually with written diagrams, you just do uh, classical physics if it is just three levels. Right, right, and it's three. Yeah. So uh, then you can formulate the problem as an initial value problem in gravity, just for gravity. Mm -hmm. You can generalize this to put matter fields, but let's first do it for pure gravity. And then you can formulate the problem in, in a body gauge. And then you can give initial data. Then we show that you can integrate the equations with initial data in two different ways, which clearly the equivalent is the same system of equations. One is by giving data on the horizon, and the other is by giving data on the conformal boundary. So the, the, the two are related. Uh, okay, so, so uh, are, are you describing uh, just this kind of uh, uh, general uh, theorem-like thing where uh, you're saying that uh, the, the, the mapping exists or, or calculating the mapping? Well, the mapping is, uh, okay, it is given algorithmically, so it's, uh, so she tells you how to, uh, integrate the equations step by step, the same way that Body did it in, uh, in the 60s, mm -hmm. but now for, uh, for gravity with the cosmological constant. Uh, uh, Kostos, then, can I ask, uh, you're, you're, I, I, I presume you're giving like phi and phi dot on one end or the other and integrating forward or back. Yeah, so uh, this is the analog, yeah. So, so for instance, if you're on the conformal boundary, that would be the source and the verb. Right, and right. then uh, there is an analogous thing along the horizon, yes. Right, but, but it's two, what I'm saying, it's two pieces of information on uh, it's two pieces phi and phi dot. It's two pieces of information. And, and you, one, one would say the same thing even in asymptotically flat space, that if you give me, you know, if you give me the information in the, uh, uh, the phi and phi dot in the far past that can evolve into the future or vice versa, when we talk about an amplitude, it's slightly different because it's like we're giving the information just the phi on one end and the other end. So it's a more sort of globally defined problem because we have to, we're, we're sort of specifying the plane wave behavior of infinity. Um, so there, uh, so. No, but yeah, in this so, case, you still need to define in a sense that the boundary conditions, right? So in a sense, right, giving the right. five. Well, that, that, so, right, that, so that, that's actually what I was gonna ask uh, 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 Yasha, exactly, exactly this. That I presume what you're doing is sort of fixing phi on one boundary. If you're doing scalars, you'd be you're fixing phi on the horizon and phi on the boundary. That's the kind of the, the closest analog to what we do with uh, with uh, amplitudes. Is that what you're doing, or is what you're doing? If you're specifying phi and phi dot 
on one end, then it's, then it's an evolution problem, just of the sort Casas was describing. But if you're describing phi and phi dot, it's more like, uh, sorry, if you're describing, if you're fixing phi on both ends, it's more like an amplitude. Right. So, so the, the way I would think about it is that kind of sp specifying uh, like both of them uh, would be the more general uh, version of the problem, uh, but, uh, but, but it's harder and I don't need it. Uh, the reason I don't need it uh, is that uh, like if uh, really what I care about is the static patch, uh, then I, I only need uh, half the horizon, really. And then it's my choice how to package half the information. And it turns out that the nicest choice of uh, how to package it uh, is uh, to make things uh, even or odd uh, under the antipodal map between the two halves. Um, and uh, at, at least for a while, so it seemed, it's uh, cer certainly true at, uh, at uh, free level and uh, continues to be usefully true uh, at uh, three point, uh, this turns out to be equivalent uh, to uh, choosing uh, just uh, w one of the two conformal weights uh, on the boundary. Uh, so and then what happens to be convenient uh, is to switch on uh, only the higher conformal weight on the boundary uh, because uh, then uh, roughly speaking uh, when you evolve uh, in the Poincaré conformal time uh, it, uh, it doesn't uh, back react to spoil the initial data. Can I ask a question? Um, yeah, so I, I share your general philosophy. I find it easier to think about a sort of similar but diff distinct patch, the DSDS patch. And there we did do scattering calculations from, from one side to the other side and also the reflection coefficient back to the first side. Um, and there, you know, one aspect of the physics, which is true in any, any attempt at dissider holography is um, you know, so-called localized gravity or still lower dimensional gravity propagating is always there in one form or another. Um, so in, in this sort of calculation in the DSDS patch, what happens is there's a bound state, much like in Randall syndrome theory, um, which is, um, you know, it's a smooth geometry. There's no Planck brain, but nonetheless, there's a, there's a localized graviton, so to speak. So in the static patch, I would expect the same. Does your, this is a question before you get into the nonlinear part. Um, at the level of the two-point functions, do you see that physics here and, and where? Uh, okay, so here I'm uh, failing to connect. Uh, so how, how do we manage to talk about uh, uh, bound state uh, type thing for uh, just the free graviton? Well, if you're familiar with, I mean, in, in the case I work on, I could tell you all the details. It's, if you're familiar with Randall syndrome, it's, it's like their volcano potential and there's a, there's a bound state there. Um, here, I don't know, maybe it's just some zero mode uh, for you, but uh, you know, there should, be, there should be fluctuating lower dimensional gravity here. There's nothing that decouples it and that mode should be part of your story. I see, um, I see. That's something so, you expect yes, localized that, that, Sorry, I mean, are, are you expecting that if he imagines putting, uh, specifying boundary conditions on, on, the, on the horizon, that would be like a block brain? Well, no, I mean, in, you know, in the DSDS case, it's really like Randall syndrome. The UV is the middle, and that's where the, the localized graviton, you know, that's where the, the bound state lives. Um, uh, and, you know, it's interesting because not everybody has a bound state. So increasingly massive fields and strings don't have the bound state. Um, so in the lower dimensional description, what UV completes gravity is, is not, you know, localized everything, <laughs> but the, but the low-lying modes, including the graviton, are um, localized just as in uh, what you're used to in, in the UV part of, of Randall syndrome. Right. Um, I think we're showing our age and maybe other people don't think about that as that, that organization as much, <laughs> but, but uh, I think it's, you know, it's, it's, no, to me it's easy. I, mean, well, so it, I, I was just, I, where, where do you think in, in the story Yasha is talking about the, uh, the, the Erzot's Planck brain might be? 
Well, it doesn't necessarily need to be a Planck rate. I'm just uh, anticipating that there should be dynamical gravity left over. Uh, if, if not, that would be the biggest surprise in the, in the situation. So I'm not saying where it should be in this, in this language. I mean, it, you know, it's some mode, presumably. Uh, so I'm asking him, what, it, what is it here? Mm -hmm. I'm telling you what it is in the DSDS uh, patch um, and in that way of organizing things, which by the way, has quite a bit of symmetry. So it, it's, it's um, those calculations are straightforward. But yeah, so that was a long winded way of asking, you know, where is your dynamical gravity that's left over? Um, uh, okay, so calibration question. Uh, so you, you, you said uh, zero frequency and uh, you said uh, lo lower dimensional. Uh, so, so, so is that wh what we're talking about? So if we're in four dimensional de Sitter, uh, then uh, there's a three dimensional uh, data on the horizon. Uh, and then uh, you're uh, talking about some uh, uh, two dimensional uh, subtlety somewhere on the edge of it. Uh, or not? Well, in essence, I'm saying that the neck of the sitter fluctuates. And so however you organize your modes, uh, you know, that that fluctuation should be part of the story. Um, the, the, the neck it, being this uh, can, bifurcation sphere here? The neck just being the, the you know, the, the middle slice, the, the uh, tau equals zero slice in your picture. Um, so can, 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 I ask, can I ask a little, I think a question related to you was, but maybe it's phrased a little bit differently. Like in flat space, we, we can assume that at the symptotic infinity, you know, metric doesn't fluctuate apart from some small fluctuations that we're sending in. And that, that's why we can define a nice matrix on perturbative level and gravity. Do we have this here? Is there any reason to believe that uh, uh, near horizons where you set up your initial and final data, there is some dilution of interaction? I think no, no, at least naively one would say that no, that there is always, uh, that gravity doesn't get weakly coupled there in any sense. So, so one wouldn't expect to define something non-perturbatively. I, I think I, it's related I to what Eva is saying. Agree. There is no so, regime where you can decouple gravity. That's true. Yeah, that's yeah, true. the way, I guess, I guess let me just add to Victor's way of describing it. Uh, it's possible that still one could formulate it because it becomes lower dimensional gravity. And as we all know, lower dimensional gravity is somewhat easier, although here it's with a lot of Yeah, 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 okay. But it's yeah, more, yeah. it's another level of- By the, by the way, one of these versions, by the way, one of these versions of, one of these versions of the TT bar plus with Victor Lambda two um, deformation would captures the static patch. And then it's like what Nemo was asking. Indeed, you, you know, the, the deformation buys you something living in the holographic sense on the where you're working the boundary of uh, this the static patch that version isn't as appealing because the causality properties are not as nice so it's faster to move through the bulk than it is to stay along the boundary whereas in say ads Poincaré or dsds the the usual ads cft like causality properties hold um, so in some ways it's simpler in some ways it's not um, but anyway in in all cases you you, you know you have to integrate over the um, so in that language, you have to integrate over the metric on the on the boundary. It's not a fixed thing, and as Victor says, that complicates the completeness of the for, uh, formulation. So this is I, we don't need to dwell on this. My my question was just that you know that's got to be in your calculations somewhere as well, um, and it's it's not even about the nonlinearities. It's just you know kind of a zeroth order question. Uh, if okay. I may ask, just because I cannot follow completely, why do you say that it's impossible to just consider a scalar field theory without gravity and a fixed background and send uh, and plan to infinity? Oh, no, that, that, is, that is possible. I think Eva was asking questions about gravitons, so that's why I jumped in. Sorry, he's doing that and he's saying, I want to define uh, some observable on this space time and then maybe I look at spin two objects moving on it but he's not doing that yet. Okay, fair enough. If it's beyond the scope, I apologize. I seem to uh, ask opposite questions in alternate talks because in the last talk I was, I wanted to dumb it down to basic field theory on the background. So sorry, if this is beyond the scope, uh, no problem. But I think it's very so, interesting. No, but, but it's, it, it's, it's interesting to talk about kind of exactly what's beyond scope. Um, 
so so yes, I think not like, non-perturbative uh, gravity. Yes, of course, nobody understands uh, how to define uh, observables in uh, the bulk. That's uh, uh, <laughs> that's what we're all here for. Uh, so. So for gravity, uh, we're thinking only perturbatively. Perturbatively, of course, uh, everything is nice. Uh, you know, horizon is a, a null hypersurface. It's like uh, the light cone formalism uh, in flat space time. Uh, like the reason I like higher spin gravity uh, is that uh, I think it does, in fact, make sense uh, non-perturbatively uh, in the sitter. Uh, and something that can be thought of as a fixed geometry uh, with, uh, with all the dynamical fields, including the one that looks like a graviton, uh, just uh, living on top of that. Uh, and then the questions in the sitter can at least be made well defined. And then your, your only remaining yeah, problem. There, there, I think you're referring to the DSCFT framework, and I think there's no longer any controversy that. There also there's gravity. So if you want to compute some, you know, expectation value, I'm sure you're aware of this argument, but let me just state it for the record. I mean, if you want to uh, compute some expectation value, you end up integrating, you know, psi dag or psi integration over the, the boundary metric. So you have to be able to formulate that that gravitational path integral also in this no, case. At the boundary, fine. But uh, again, if you actually live in the sitter, you don't see the boundary. If we're not talking about uh, inflation where it's, uh, fake the sitter. Uh, so how, how to define uh, observables uh, when uh, you're uh, stuck between a pair of horizons? Uh, oh, oh, so you mean higher spin not in this kind of philosophy of within the, um, within the, the static patch. Uh, and you're saying that yeah, that is well, you're saying that that is well defined because these higher spin theories in the in the bulk are easier theories of of sort of gravity. Is that yes? Yes, that's yeah, okay. 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 Um, okay. Of course, you know one wants large radius, and I think that that is inevitably more more complex, but still something we can handle. We just have to bring in all the tools that we have uh, from top down and everything else for it, but. This is getting a little bit off track. Um, let me say the thing one more, let me say another more physical way of asking a similar question to what um, Victor and I were asking, um, which is just one true true thing about the sitter is if you send too much in toward the neck, it crunches. So there's, there's you know, that's a very lowbrow way to think to, for thinking about, you know, the entropy bound. Uh, uh, and and um, so, you know, you couldn't be able, you know, when it comes to incorporating gravity, you shouldn't be able to send in as much as, you know, you want uh, for that sort of very basic reason. Um, okay, I'll stop. Thanks. Uh, oh, okay, j j just to make sure, I, I agree with the last statement. Was it the question? No, it was just a motivation for, you know, considering what you're doing in that you know, in with it with the gravity included at that level because it's it's you know it's practical to include it at that level and it has a, a big impact on the on the dynamics. In other words, there's no there's no uh, if it crunches there's no transmission transition to the later part of your triangle. Um, so it, you know it has right. a huge effect. Right. Um, uh, right. Uh, so. Yeah, so, so Jan, the, the sitter uh, in like, actual uh, quantum gravity, uh, I, I, I would feel uh, very anxious uh, about uh, even uh, drawing uh, both uh, past and future uh, conformal boundary. Um, <laughs> oh, oh yeah, it, it decays and all of that. Yeah. yeah, that's all important. I agree. Um, but um, but that, sorry, that, I, that, thought, I thought you asked the, the the question you're asking is to set the uh, is to set the boundary conditions on the on the 45 degree line. I mean, the, the question you're asking is just what we always do in inflation. Um, it's just maybe you you want to. I mean, what we always do in inflation is essentially say it's the vacuum on that on the on the 45 degree line, it's and then we. I don't the, want it to be a vacuum. Oh, you don't want it to be a vacuum, it's fine. But we know exactly how to do that in perturbation theory. We just allow some incoming modes. Um, 
and then then we can compute and everything is fine. So so um, but once you're specifying boundary conditions on the 45 degree line, you've evaded this problem of crunching because you're not trying to do an in you're not trying to map the past future boundary to the future uh, boundary, which would have this terrible problem with the crunches, uh, any tiny perturbation crunching it. You're you're basically saying uh, let me go let me allow something more general than the than the uh, than the uh, bunch Davies vacuum. Um, in the past in inflation and just ask for the most general things that I can have also allowing incoming modes uh, and to see what you see uh, outside, right? That's the right, that's for setup, that. right? Well, that's for, for the square rooted uh, problem for single uh, horizon uh, to boundary, that, 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 that's exactly right. 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 Um, like where, so what is it you want to do with that? What, what is your non-square rooted problem then? I didn't quite quite understand. No, the the, the, the non-square rooted problem uh, is uh, is the static patch, so evolving one horizon to another. Um, oh, you want to evolve the past horizon to the future. That's considering kind of two two point career patches at the same time, uh, and then if you want to do uh, non-perturbative uh, gravity, you need to start worrying about Eva's objections. But even without non-perturbative gravity, I mean, I would think you would worry any tiny amount of dust in the past is going to destroy your 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 global desitter. Well, there's there's a, there's so, a sorry, I mean, that, that's there's a finite amount you're allowed, which corresponds basically to the desitter entropy, you know. But but it's it's tiny. No, and no, you, no but, sorry, I, I meant any finite density of matter yeah, in the yeah. past is going to do something. Yes, that's, yes. Right. That's, that's right. That's right. Yeah. But he can he yeah. can send in a few modes if he wants. Sure, but, sure, but, sure, sure. Yes, yes, I, I agree with that. But, uh, but, but yeah, but, the uh, thing you said, the thing you said, Nima, about you know, yeah, we can talk about excited states. People do it all the time. There's particle right. production, blah. blah, blah. Right, but right, that's right. that's not his. I thought that's not his question because he's doing this. Uh, no, but that, that that is his square root question, though. That that so that that is your like first first question. But then you want to use that to somehow get this other. Uh, uh, this more S matrix like thing from the past horizon to the future horizon, although there, there, there I do worry just physically about this uh, issue of, of uh, uh, you can only throw in a few modes before, well, parametrically large if the entropy is large, but, but that's, that's some important piece of the physics that, uh, that you're going to, uh, that, 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 that you crunch the uh, desitter background with any, any finite initial density. Uh, but, but, you, but if you're sorry, but if you're setting up, I already asked this on the Slack. But if you're setting up some uh, in, incoming modes on the past horizon, I would imagine it's related to these uh, correlators with folded singularities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, yeah. But but Yasha seemed to disagree with me, so that's why I'm. Uh, I wanted to hear exactly why he doesn't think that that's. Uh, maybe if Dan Green is around, he can. I don't know if he's around. He can say something about it but um i thought well, so you were just Mirdod, Mirdod, Mirdod wrote, wrote papers about mode and the static patch recently didn't you are you still here uh sorry but this for the singularity i think it comes when you have an infinite time to evolve instead uh, probably it's gonna only give a finite time so maybe there's a for the booster but it's not gonna it is infinite point correct time uh, in the limit going from z equals zero to z equals infinity. Um, but uh, I, I, I still I, I still think I'm uh, m missing the the point. So uh, so we, we have uh, again some legs on the boundary, uh, some legs on the horizon. Uh, but if, in terms of the spatial uh, 3D momentum, uh, it's not that uh, the momentum of the legs on the horizon is small. Uh, so w why are we talking about the folded limit? No, no, no. You, you would take the energy and flip the sign of uh, the energy. So if yeah. you... Okay, that was the, the second folded... part of your statement. But, but yeah. first, why folded limit? Ah, we just... Yeah, that, that, the... that's where you... Yeah. Yeah, we just refer to it as the folded limits because that's where the signal peaks. But uh, it's just the, the way that people that do data analysis refer to the shape. I, I, see. I mean, your, 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 your three-point functions in your example will have poles and really physical poles that you can reach for physical values of K1, K2, and K3. Yes. Uh, oh, okay, okay. Now I know I understand where the words folded limit are coming from and, and, and we can get back uh, to the question. Uh, of uh, so, so so your your statement was uh, 
uh, that uh, the say uh, boundary boundary uh, horizon correlator uh, should be the same uh, as uh, a boundary 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 correlator uh, but, but uh, w with the one of the uh, absolute value k's flipped is, is that what you were saying yeah that's the claim yeah uh, okay uh, so so that uh, so, so that sounds, sounds strange so my uh, my attempt uh, at uh, disproving it uh, would be that uh, that sounds uh, like uh, it has uh, the full de Sitter symmetry uh, whereas it shouldn't um, but but but, uh, but but I think I still don't understand the, the Kind of the, the positive version of your logic. So yeah. So yeah, the, the idea is that when you compute, uh, kind of uh, starting on the vacuum, you all act with a's, and you get all e to the minus i tau k. And so when you sum all of those k's, you get k totals, and those are the only poles that you get if you start with the vacuum. And the good thing about that pole is that you cannot reach it for physical momenta because k total is zero only when all the k's are zero. Now, if, if instead you create a particle in the initial state, you have some daggers at the, at the initial state. And so then you have to contract that with a, a, a frequency with the opposite sign. And so you get K1 plus K2 minus K3. Mm -hmm. And people are worrying that that is sometimes zero. In fact, for physical real momenta, that happens to be zero. And when that's zero, you have divergences in your uh, uh, integral. Your, your interaction goes on forever. No, but I, I thought Guy's statement is not just that people are worrying that there's a singularity, but that the, the actual full answer away from the singularity can be read off uh, uh, yeah. from uh, the, the, the pure boundary correlator. Yeah, that's the uh, claim, I think. Yeah. What, what, why do you say it's not the Sitter invariant? The horizon is the Sitter invariant. The, what, why are you saying it's not the Sitter invariant? A choice of horizon is not the sitter invariant. It's picking a point on the boundary. It's, break, it's breaking the special conformals of the boundary. No, but no, no, no more than, okay. Um, it's, it's not worse than doing ADS CFT in point correct coordinates. No, that's and you right. get the, that's, 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 you get that's, the entire that's what CFT I mean. Yeah. Uh, on it, the it's plane. a very mild, I mean, the, the sort of dependence uh, disappears as you go to the other boundary. Yeah, exactly. It's exactly the same as, it's exactly the same as an inflation. Um, or an ADS-CFT. No, I, I agree that you can do pure boundary correlators in whatever coordinates you want, and the answer will be invariant under the full group. Uh, but but we're talking about correlators uh, with the legs on the horizon, uh, and you're telling me that that is invariant under the full de-sitter group, uh, and, and that sounds strange. But that, that shouldn't that be similar to just considering some state, non-vacuum state in a, in a CFT? I mean, again, if we try to, in, to interpret the same thing in ADS CFT language, then what, it would probably be some insertion of some operator in the far past, so that now we have some non-trivial state, so it's not conformally invariant in that state because it's not in the vacuum, but okay. If you transform also the operator, that the external leg, of course, would, transform accordingly, right? But then but even that's not that's not that's the same as, as when all the legs are on the future. Every, every point breaks the symmetry and you have to transform everyone to get the right answer. Uh, to get all, it to be all of that is yeah. of course fine. <laughs> um, uh, uh, but but uh, okay, how, 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 how do I uh, Get, get this. Uh, well, so, so have you? Uh, so maybe, maybe what would settle it is what is the answer for that three-point function? It's uh, just for a scalar, just uh, just for a simple scalar interaction. Uh, so for the uh, for the scalar with the cubic uh, interaction, uh, it's. Uh, it's some log of uh, the 
Yeah, but, but the question is, is it log K1 plus K2 plus K3 or log K1 plus K2 minus K3? Uh, <laughs> I think, I think actually, a combination of both. Log K1 plus K2 minus K3, huh? It, it's a combination of both. Oh, right. But it should have a piece that's log K1 plus K2 minus K3. Yes, it has a piece, of course. I, I agree with the, the, the singularity yeah, right, must be yeah. there, yes. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah, maybe we should uh, we should move. No, on. in fact, I'm I'm sorry. Yes, thank you very much. So I, I think we just disproved uh, the claim uh, because uh, because I'm I'm saying that the answer uh, contains uh, pieces with both signs. So if we flip the sign, we still have pieces of both signs, uh, and then we would reach the conclusion that uh, the ordinary correlator uh, has a singularity where it shouldn't. Uh, but, uh, but since we okay. have another since we have another session, should we dis uh, leave this for a private discussion? The remaining um, actually we're already forty five minutes late, so I'll try to keep this uh, short. Um, I think we have.